you know, I'm really, I'm really excited to share this topic because a, it's hard as working in a platform. These kind of topics are harder to talk about, mostly because people tend to argue with instead of discuss with why things are how they are. So we don't get to talk about as much as we'd like. And that's reason why I should tackle it. But B, I was one of those people. You know, I, I before I took this role, I had the, a very public stance that every program should be YOLO scope. And you know what? I was wrong. <laughs> So obviously there are programs that have YOLO scope conditions. They're definitely in the minority for a paid program structure. And I think throughout this video, you'll see why that is today. There's some sometimes an understanding that people don't care about out of scope, but it's complicated. And I want to try and explain some of the reasons to help you to understand why things land how they do, because it's not always something that you can explain in a queue when you're talking about a company. You can't discuss sensitive information about that company. So having this full understanding, I think will help you to get a better grasp of why A, you shouldn't go out of scope, especially if private invites is what you're seeking, and B, why scope is how it is. And so the first situation, let's say that we have a company, they've got an asset and they've run a series of pen tests, they're ready for a bug bounty program. But let's say this company's in a federated structure. And so in a federated business structure, you might have a company in every state, but they sit under a national brand. So let's say that this is main.com and we've chosen to engage with state a.main.com. Now that asset is ready for testing. There's a security team that's ready for testing it. But at the end of the day, the budget line for that in a federated business structure isn't shared with the rest of the parties. They will share marketing activities and other, other elements to it, much like a franchise will. However, they'll have their own security budget and their own budget for that application. In that particular situation, if you get out of scope and you submit a finding for b.main.com when the scope is prescribed as a.main.com, it won't be eligible for an award, or it may not be. It can't be enforced for an award from the platforms. However, companies may choose to offer it. And the reason for that is that the budget has been allocated for a.main.com's success. They don't want to pay for every finding in the main logo. They want to show success within their region, within what they've put up for testing, because that's also the part that they've prescribed as being ready for testing. It's at that point, the success of the program is dependent on how that scope performs. When a lot of people go out of scope, then it's actually diluting the success of that program and it dilutes the ability to expand that program into other logos because it looks like it's more of a risky proposition than it would be to just have people operating in scope. For those reasons, when people are known to commonly go out of scope, they won't receive those private invites. And this doesn't just apply to Bugcrowd. Other platforms will track similar activity the same. When you have a company that has a prescribed goal and that goal is important to growth of the program, then behavior that people have taken in the past matters for matching with invites. One of the biggest misconceptions that happens in the bug bounty space is that points matter for invites. They don't, and they're purely a virtue signal. They're not the key depender on what you're going to receive. Behaviors in how you report and behaviors in how you operate in scope conditions, as well as the re reproducibility of your bug are the biggest drivers to what kind of private invites you'll receive. So we're going to assume that this secondary goal, we're going to go to a bigger company now. We're going to say that there's a company, main.com again for the sake of example, but in this case, it's a holistic budget line for security. This company all wraps up into one security budget. They can cover the majority of assets in the company. So why then in that circumstance would you see items that aren't eligible for an award or aren't in scope? And the principal driver in that case is M&A or mergers and acquisitions. Larger organizations acquire companies regularly, and those companies will have different conditions for what would allow a security program such as a bug bounty to exist. In a merger and acquisition, typically the acquisition will go through a series of pen tests before it's even close to being ready for consumption by an internal red team or by a bug bounty program. So that company could care a great deal about security, care a great deal about findings, but the budget spend for that, that part of the organization is already allocated to a pen testing budget line. And so it may not be eligible for an award out of scope, or it could be explicitly listed as out of scope for a window of time and intended to come into scope down the line. In that situation, 
you could also cause some harm by going out of scope because you could start off a chain of incidents. When an acquisition happens, the company that was acquired might have its own security team that's still merging into the main security team or handing over to the main security team with its own SOC. When you go out of scope there, you can fire up a lot of incidents and they're not prepared for the bug bounty program or they don't know the bug bounty program exists. And when you spin off those incidents, there's a cost to the program, to the platform and an escalation that occurs around it that is going to be detrimental to the hope of an award. And so in that case, you are better off waiting until that asset comes into scope once it's gone through a matured security lifecycle. You know, there's other fascinating reasons too. I'm never going to get to all the edge cases. But another one is a large company that has signed themselves up for a bug bounty platform and they're mature, they're ready in their security team. They've got pen testing done, they're comfortable with it, but there could be a capacity issue. They're not sure yet how many resources they want to put behind a bug bounty program. So they might start small and then grow as they can get an understanding of the load it's going to add to their team. So in that situation, you might see a big logo, add a set number of assets in scope and then increase it over time to get an understanding of what vulnerabilities they're going to have to pay for so they can work out the budget they need and make the right business cases internally for it. You know, I've worked in companies before where everything had to be justified to the dollar and leeway either way would lead to you being represented as a bad manager, especially possible in fintech organizations. In those situations, a smaller allows for measurement and activity to then portray into the company because it's not realistic for the platforms to always provide hard data for that because organizations are so varied, not just in the division that they're in, but in the technology that they use. It, unlike other sectors where you can say, typically, you know, your farming warehouse supply company gets this many findings, you know, one that runs on WordPress versus one that uses bespoke applications, there's a totally different level of activity to those two companies, even though in other verticals, you can say similar based data. So, you know, it makes it nuanced and reasons like this often lead to what people then perceive as, oh, they're just, they're a big company, they can afford it, why don't they pay for it? You know, businesses are complicated and the essence of scope boils down to just that. Businesses are complicated. And it's the program and the platform's best interest to widen that scope, both for the findings to come in and because, you know, key success of bug bounties relies on larger scopes, but it's a marathon, not a race. And it's important that parties are both prepared for it, budgeted for it, so everybody gets looked after properly and rushing everything to be a large scope isn't the dutable way to do that. And so it leads to these complications. And I hope that in exposing a lot of what can happen behind the scenes here, you've got a better understanding of why it is. And, you know, be nice to your triager. Your triager isn't the one in control of these situations. They're late stage to these negotiations, and they're often not going to be able to give you as much information as you would like to know why something's not in scope if it's sensitive to the company structure. All right, I, I hope I did that justice. And, you know, I want to point out, like, I've tried to give as much detail here as I can, and I do want to tackle these harder subjects. And I hope you can appreciate that, you know, I myself am not someone who makes all of these decisions. I run a security operations team, and it's because I have a bit of understanding of business and I've worked in other businesses that I can dilute and match a lot of this back. So if you disagree with anything I said, you know, let's have a discussion, not an argument. This is something where I want to keep taking harder subjects and exposing what I can to help you make better decisions. And I hope after seeing this one, you'll see if, you know, your goal is to be a successful hunter, stepping out of scope isn't really the way you're going to get there. And, you know, end of the day, I understand why people think that it is. I made the same mistakes, as I said in the opener. But with what I know today, you know, even though I had so much success, I reflect most of that came by getting to know programs and getting to really understand their application and going deep on findings. And you, you hear this advice a lot that success in bug bounties is deep understanding. It's not, you know, hashtag bug bounty tips, get a quick win and go for it. Recon, which we'll cover separately down the line, is a tool to help you understand, not a source of findings. Now, there are findings there, but it shouldn't be the pure driver that you've got. And I think it's this mentality that's manifested of, hey, I have to go for recon and one click finding and all of this, that is what's leading to people thinking that they have to expand their scope as wide as possible.
So I'm going to tackle that and I'm going to expand on that. But I want to touch on it at the end here because this is... <laughs> Let's just... We're too far to change this now. We're leaving that in. I, I wanted to touch on it because end of the day, I know where this sentiment drives from. I have been there. I have been at the forefront with you all and I flipped my understanding and it was a very quick education for me to see why. And I want to try and correct some of, I guess, the harm I get gave by permeating this, uh, this understanding. And I think, you know, some of the recon tools I've written have also permeated a negative understanding of what it takes to be a successful bug hunter. So I'm going to follow this up. I'm going to talk about what comes after recon soon. It's a little bit away, but just know for now that the sentiment that you often see is, you know, <sighs> go deep understand deep and use recon as a tool to do that don't use recon as a one-click wonder there are definitely people that make a lot of money automating with just recon there's not room for everyone to do that and impact impact is what's going to make you the most successful hunter possible and impact is driven from a deep level understanding not a high level understanding from recon right we'll cover this more soon but thank you if you got this far i really appreciate it I'd love to have a discussion on Twitter. I, I really do, I really do care, even though, you know, this is one of those things that uh, it can get twisted. Love you all. Thank you. Cheers.